Well, uh, good morning and welcome. Welcome to HG Church, guys. Uh, just want to say I'm glad you guys are here this morning. I pray, like I said, your hearts are opened and you're ready to receive this morning's word. Every, um, every season when we do our, our family series, I always ask our, our, some of our, our leaders in, in the church to share a little bit. Um, and so this morning I have a, uh, we have a the great, um, awesome opportunity to hear from uh, Brother Ryan Galvin, our, our, youth, uh, our youth leader, him and his wife, Valerie, they lead the youth here at HD Church, and they've been, you know, doing their, doing their very best to just keep these teenagers connected. But if you don't know um, a little bit about Ryan's story, um, he's got a great testimony of how God really just brought him back in and, and, and secured his faith. And so now I know he'll tell you a little bit about it, but, you know, he was former, you know, I'm sorry, not former. He's a Marine. Yep. Once a Marine, always a Marine. And um, served in the infantry and did some time overseas and uh, God brought him back and, and then now he's married with a family. And so I know he's, he, he's, he's less than me, right? He's only like four years in, right? Is it four? Yeah, he's only four years in. So I always put that disclaimer out. I know he will too. But would you guys do me a favor and welcome Brother Ryan Galvin. morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Very well. Uh, It's an honor and privilege to uh, speak to everyone. Uh, I never take it lightly. Um, I just pray that you can open up your hearts and minds and uh, receive. I know that we wrestle with a lot of emotion and our minds starting to to run, our flesh battling with us as we even come to church. Maybe as we walked in early this morning as we were uh, coming to worship. Uh, maybe we had some issues getting here, or even sitting here trying to just get focused and, and pay attention and, and get in sync with, um, with worship in general. So I just pray that um, we just focus and um, clear our hearts, open up our minds, and receive. Oh, Amen. My name is Ryan, for those of you who have not met me or do not know me, and um, I was born and raised here in this church, took some time away at age 18 to go uh, serve in the United States Marine Corps um, for eight years. Pretty much at 18, I, I left and didn't come back till I was 30. There was like a, uh, it was good, a lot of downs. I'd say more downs than good. And um, as I finally got planted in my foundation here back um, in my hometown and in church, um, just everything began to um, just move forward in a positive, uh, in a positive manner. And uh, I began to just um, open my heart and my mind and, and start not just reading and say, I want to be here and be involved in church, but actually uh, do what the scripture teaches us to do, which you hear every, every single Sunday and anytime you're praying and begin reading. I just started doing that and just things started to unfold. Any issues that started to come my way, what does Pastor Eric always say? How are we going to respond to any of that? How are you going to respond if you desire to follow God? How do you respond to that? So a lot of my responses, even during the, the troubled times or when I feel um, things aren't going my way, um, my responses to that were, were a lot different. It wasn't how I used to act before or respond uh, when I was younger. Um, I have been married for, I am married. I am married. I have been. I still have. I am married. Bear with me. Four, four years, one month, and 28 days. I know, Mr. Lawrence, I, I can't compete with that. Okay, hey, but four years, everybody would be like, oh, you're only married a year, oh, you're only married two years, four, four years, college degree, if you're on the fast track, maybe a master's added to that, Amen. military enlistment, Amen. job promotions, maybe supervisor, four years is quite a while to get to know someone, so four years into marriage, three kids, a nine-year-old, a three-year-old, and a one-year-old, all good things. Good arguments, but I don't think we have time to discuss all those. <laughs> hey, but our response, right? right? So as we move forward in this, um, I just want to get directly right into this. Um, there's, there's a huge epidemic going on that I, I think we talk about it very, like sometimes often, but not directly as I'm about to say right now. And so I did some research on this and just hit the statistics on it. I know your engagement with people in the church, maybe at work. Um, and just in the community in general, but a huge epidemic of fatherless homes. What I mean by fatherless homes, I'm not talking about uh, a divorced home or 
um, maybe a divorce she married and blend. No, none of that. I'm talking about a father neglecting their responsibility as a father to their child. Now, if they're divorced, father's still involved. You're still involved in, in, in your kid's life. Right. But in, in, our, in our country and the United States, it, it's extremely westernized that where we have the highest statistics of a fatherless home. And I'm just going to read some uh, information here and data. According to the data from 2022, there are approximately 18.3 million children across America who live without a father in a home, comprising of about one in four children in the United States. This comes from the U.S. Census Bureau of 2022 because 2023 stats have not come out yet. In single households, there were 37.9 million one-person households. That is 29% of all U.S. House households in 2022. Okay, in 1960, single-person households represented only 13% of America. So you see there is a 16% increase from the 1960 to 2022, which I'm assuming 2023 is probably a little bit more. Single-mother households in the United States is the highest of all countries. What are we going to do about it? All right. So point number one, break the chain. Now you think about a chain. We use chains for what? Securing buildings, securing doors, securing gates, all of the above. I was talking about this with my brother yesterday because he deals with, uh, he's a firefighter, and um, a lot of times for emergencies, they have to get through a lot of equipment to, to open doors, to break chains. So I was asking him, I'm like, hey, how do, you, how do you guys break a chain? He's like, man, we have to use a saw. There's like this specific saw or like this jaws of light. We have to cut through everything. And so we're looking at videos, and every person I seen, they had a tool, and they kept breaking apart like a chainsaw chain. So it was taking time. It was taking effort to break apart that chain. And then also it showed in, in YouTube videos um, other people as a partner grabbing bolt cutters and they're using double force to crack that, that link in that chain. All right, so you see where I'm going with this, okay? It's a generational thing within the genealogy as to why this continues to happen. Like we sit here, we come to church, okay, but what are we doing to uh, apply that into our lives? So in the book of Genesis, we have uh, the start of our genealogy and it shows a starting point at Genesis 4. You can just write this down and I'll paraphrase through it, but Genesis 4 through 46 and you'll see a series of the creation of Adam and Eve. God creates man, and he says it's not good for man to be alone, so I will give him a helper. And he gives him his wife, gives him Eve. Okay, now from Genesis 4 through 46, you, you'll see, even as you glance at your Bible right now, or as you go home and take a look through your notes, you will see a series of names, a lot of names, of so the genealogy, a bloodline. The Bible will stop, it'll explain some individuals, because it's key to the gospel and giving the message, and then it'll go on and say a few more names, giving a bloodline, so on and so forth. And so I, as I was reading this and I was going through each, each uh, chapter, very long, and going through each name, all the names as they're written out, there's about two pages where it just has names and no scriptures explaining what they, what they do. And so um, I was in a message um, once a few, 10 years ago, uh, remember we went to the Act Like Men conference. Mm -hmm. A few of us went to that. And um, there was a pastor by the name of Mark Driscoll, and, and I read his commentary on it, and a few other pastors, I read their commentary on this. And why isn't there no relevance to these names in the genealogy that leads to Jesus and the, and, and the birth of Jesus? But there's no relevance to these people because they had no relevance to the gospel. All they were was just a bloodline. So ask yourself this, what... What am I leaving behind? What genealogy am I leaving behind with, with my family, with my friends? Okay, am I going to be that, I have no other way to say this, but am I going to be that, that weak link in the chain that just continues with, with divorce and sadness and depression and anxiety and, and everything that has been generational within our family? Or are we going to grasp what, we're, what we're, we're taught here every Sunday, go over, go over these notes, apply them, and then start actually doing them? So as we move forward, we look at Psalms 107, verses 10 through 16. Psalms 107, verses 10 through 16. You follow along. Some sat in darkness and utter darkness, prisoners suffering in iron chains, because they rebelled against God's commands and despised the plans of the Most High, so he subjected them to bitter labor. 
They stumbled, and there was no one to help. Then they cried to the Lord in, in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He brought them out of darkness, the utter, dark, the utter darkness, and broke away their chains. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for mankind. For he breaks down gates of bronze and cuts through bars of iron. And so as I look through scripture and I look through my personal gene- genealogy, I look at what, what causes all this. And, and we deal with different fractures in our life. And fracture, I mean, what comes to, to mind, fracture, a broken bone, correct? And if you don't have any detail or context behind it, I'll, I'll just read a basic Google search from that. A fracture is uh, a wound, it's two types. Uh, when a fracture happens, it is classified as either an open or a closed wound. An open fracture, also called a compound fracture, where the bone breaks and pokes through the skin and can be seen. Or a deep wound exposes the bone through the skin. A closed fracture, also called a simple fracture, the bone is broken, but the skin is intact. So internally, break a bone, no one can see it, or maybe, but it's not sticking out of your body. So think about this as your own personal fracture. All of us have them. It's all our, our, our internal sin, um, the way we were raised, experiences we, we, we've had growing up, we all have them. Some of us show them outwardly, just like this definition gives us. Some people, even in church, you're walking by, try to smile and say hi, they're just mad. And in church, it's good morning, good morning. Right. Or they don't even say anything, you're like, all right. Right on. Our internal fractures, like myself, um, where you mask everything with sarcasm. If, if sarcasm was a love language, I'd be number one at that. Um, but you mask it with sarcasm. You mask it with, with pictures and, and filters, hiding everything. But deep down, you're, you're just really hurting. And so we look at uh, our first initial fracture in Genesis 3.6. You could just write this one down, um, and I'll paraphrase through it. But... In Genesis 3, 6, we have where our first fracture comes into humanity of Adam and Eve, where uh, Eve takes a bite of the apple after God directed them not to, directed Adam to look over her, but Scripture doesn't tell us where he was. I mean, look after your wife, Adam. Don't let her do this. Lead her. Um, But Scripture doesn't tell us. So we have our first uh, fracture in humanity. Well, my personal genealogy and, and my fractures, you know, it's a blessing and a curse of this gift that I have. It's nothing crazy. I just remember dates from when I was little. Well, I'm still little, but <laughs> when I was younger, you want to know what? Pastor Eric would have said that to me or some of my friends. Oh, you're still little. But, okay. My, uh, my personal genealogy, my, I remember so many dates, so I'll just go over three uh, fractures of my life. I don't, I don't live there. I don't hang out there, but I, I, I help others with them. I help your youth, your kids, your teens. I tell them everything. I'm transparent with them. That way they know, like, hey, we're, we're real. We're going we're gonna to talk about this. We're going to get through it. Not, not from what I said, but what the Bible said, and let's do this together. Let's dive in this together. Let's understand, okay, and then let's move forward from this. So uh, my first fracture... Um, Experiencing uh, my parents' divorce, my second fracture, 19 years old, experiencing death. Excuse excuse me, sorry. You know, different friends, family. And then uh, my third fracture was uh, November 10th, veteran, uh, Marine Corps birthday is during Veterans Day, 2013. I don't like when I cry, ugly cry. Um, I just had a, a cry for help. I needed help. All these fractures I thought I could take care of and, and put a Band-Aid over it. I needed them to be, to be reconstructed and broken again. 
put back together. And I was so prideful within myself, I thought I, I, thought I could do it on my own. Right. I couldn't. Man, I neglected my friends, my family, resented my mother, right. resented you guys, Les, Lewis. And so during that time frame, I knew, I'm like, I, I have to do something about it. I keep, I keep masking everything with, with uh, like I said, sarcasm and, and just trying to be um, just this macho person living in this veteran Marine Corps type life. And I wasn't in that life anymore. And I, I'm like, man, I, I have nothing to fall back on. I can't go to war and hide behind Come on now. all my armor, my squad, my crew, my team. You know, I couldn't hide behind uh, just what I was used to. I was used to just the, the chaos of, of fighting for our country, and, and um, I didn't care about the accolades. They were cool, but, I mean, coming back, once I came back here, I was just like, man, I have none of this. I can't, I can't, how am I going to move forward? I have to deal with this. You know, I'm fractured all on, on the internally. Like, what am I going to do to to be better? Like, I feel like I can't. And what I'm about to say right now, I, I didn't, I, it never came to mind. And I'm pretty sure a lot of you deal with this. That's why I'm going to say, say it. But I, I never contemplated uh, suicidal thoughts or anything. But the way I felt during that time, I, I didn't care what would happen to me on my way to work right. or in this life. I was just like, I just wanted to stop, but I wouldn't do anything to myself. I just didn't have it in me to hurt others in that way. Right. And, but I was just like, God, help me. I didn't blame him for anything. You know, sometimes we get mad at when we, certain things happen and we blame God for it. Like, God, why did you do it? But God didn't do anything. You see, the first fracture took place. Adam and Eve, what did she do? She took the initiative and took the apple. Right. What do we do? Okay, we, we know better, especially being here and hearing the gospel and hearing, hearing how God can restore you if you apply yourself. But we're doing to apply. Instead, for myself, we hang out. In 1997, from hearing in the voice, we hang out and experiences of, of, of first death and friends dying and, and not talking about these things. We hang out in these areas of experiencing depression and, and anxiety and not wanting to talk, so we think we have it all together. But what do we end up doing? We end up going through life, building calluses on ourselves, and then instead of fixing those fractures and having people help break those down for us and mend them together, we end up putting Band-Aids on them. I don't know if you know that, but Amen. excuse me, you can't you can't fix these fractures with band-aids. Right, right, and if you think about it, if you're thinking about it mentally, you're like broken bone, put a band-aid on it, it doesn't look right, nothing's gonna happen. Right. And so it has to be rebroken. So be rebroken. Some of them need pins to be put together so they're realigned. And the same thing with our lives. When we come to this reckoning that we need to do life one with 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 Jesus, but the way we do that is with people, people who you trust and you can talk to about these things and then they can give you feedback. Right. Now, here's, here's, a, here's the kicker to that. I deal with this at my job. I deal with this with family. I deal with this with friends. When you're being mentored, okay, you need to be quiet. You just need to be quiet and take it all in. And then do something about it. If you're quick to talk back or you have an answer for everything, well, you see where the problem is. Right. And I, I've dealt with this from teenagers, from my own peers, and then adults. So I'm just like, okay, so do you want mentorship and, like, help? Or do you just want to tell me all your problems and then abracadabra kaboom and then right. that's it? Because it's just not going to work that way. And so I, I think as I, as I, 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 just, I know, as I sit here and I share with you, just these personal experiences of my own life, that you can see that things can change. We heard Mr. Lucas speak about his life. I didn't know a lot of that about his life. Growing up, when I would see everybody in church, I would see them. I'm just like, man, I don't know how my parents, I don't know how they would go to work, take us to games, do everything. They'd be, they're working all day, and then we have games like in Lemoore and going out of town, and they go to work the next day. I'm just like, what? Like, how do my parents do? Now I'm a parent. I'm like, oh yep, you're just tired all the time. You don't, <laughs> you don't, you don't, you don't, you don't get any, uh, you don't get any rest. And but I look at like 
their lives and, and my parents and other adults of, of here in the church. And I'm just like, I've seen them. Mr. Mendoza, he's not here today. But like I seen, I was telling them, I, I've looked at your guys' lives, you men and women who are in here, and I've seen your ups and downs, and we notice them, but all I've seen is a consistency of up in my eyes. Why? Because you're still here, and you serve, and you're, and, and you're doing this. So the genealogy I see of you in this moment is, is it's happening with your children, with, with other people, with people like myself who are looking at you. And so as we move forward, we're in point number two, intentional forgiveness. Uh, Pastor Eric talks about forgiveness so much, and that's important. You can see from point number one, of just me giving you minor details of the fractures, of, the fractures I had in my life. I had uh, zero forgiveness. I just had a, um, a prideful heart that followed me, and I, I, kept, I kept on for, for many years while everybody else forgave each other, my parents, who, are, who divorced, who are now happily married to their spouses, Sitting here and serving at this church. Now I know, okay, wait, here we go. I got to say this too, because I know even in church, our minds start going like, what, 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 huh? Get to know who they are. You want to know who they are? Get to know who they are. One teaches divorce care. The other one's head of the department of the ushers. You want to know? Go talk to them. Before we let our, our minds start getting in the gutter and going wild, okay, there they are right there. You can go, you can go talk to them and see how... God has restored their lives, Amen. has brought everything back together, how friendships can, can take place, how forgiveness can take place. Well, if everybody has forgiven each other, and here I am, like, oh, my me, look at me. I'm just sitting back here like, that had nothing to do with me. <laughs> but that's when, this is what I'm talking about when, when we talk about our genealogy and intentional forgiveness. Okay, what are you leaving behind? Okay, there was forgiveness that taken place while your kids are watching. These conversations need to also take place. Right. And I, 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 I'm, like I, I told you guys, I will sit here and I will help your youth. I will help your teens. My wife will help your teens. We will talk. We will cry together. We will grow together. They know it. They can vouch for it. Without me even saying this, you can go talk to them. Right. Get, your own, get your own input based off of them. I've already talked to a lot of your teens. There is nothing they are going to tell us that is going to, hurt us. There's nothing you're going to say where I'm going to be ashamed of them at all. Amen. I talked to my parents about this, but these are the same conversations that should, they should have been having with myself, my brother. It's all learning, though. But you want to know what? I can respond different in my life now and dealing with my kids and our teens, and that's, that's where I'm at, Amen. applying, right? Instead of living in March... 10th, 1997, oh my God, this divorce, oh, no, done, over with. Yeah. Everybody forgave each other, here I am, move forward from that. Amen. Intentional forgiveness, yes, we, we, you have to forgive. If you're going to call yourself a follower of, uh, of Christ, you need to forgive one another. Okay, now trust is a whole different thing. You can forgive someone, but as far as the trust, it has to be built up again. Right. In order to move forward, um, well, one, I had to get over my prideful heart. Um, I had finally come to peace with my experiences overseas and, and fighting um, overseas um, as the United States Marine in the infantry. Um, I never thought that that would really uh, dig deep into me, but um, I, I, uh, I gave myself 100% to that. That's what I told myself. I'm, I'm a United States Marine. This is who I am. This is who I'm going to be. And if I die doing this, and I die doing what I love. All right. So now I need to do the same thing as I follow Christ. Right. And so that's, that's where I'm at right now in that life. I had a hard time moving that over because I felt that once I left that area of my life, that that had, uh, that had died for me, that drive. Right. Like I couldn't move forward because everything was given to that. And so when I was put in this element of doing regular life, a good life. I just didn't know how. I didn't know how to. I didn't know how to react to kindness, forgiveness, love, happiness, joy, forgiveness, everything. The fruits of the spirit. My friends, family, all of you guys were, were doing that for me, and I just couldn't. I couldn't receive any of that. 
It, I was used to just the chaos. Right. And that's what I needed to, to just adapt. I remember telling you when I, you were like, hey, how's it going? It was like 2014. I'm like, hey, I'm going to take a job overseas. I'm going to be a security contractor. Right. You're, you're like, all right, right on. And some people were like, oh, okay, cool, man. That sounds cool. You're going to be doing what you love. But then others were just like, I just remember your reaction, Mr. Lucas. You are like, <laughs> like, you didn't want to say why, but you're like, all right, now. We'll pray for you. I'm like, I'm like thank you. Like, thank you. But I put myself in situations to try to put a Band-Aid on those fractures. And like, I, still, I was still helping people and, and like doing what I love, but I wasn't taking care of the root cause of that fracture. I was just continuing to, to feed it and feed it and feed it, uh, serving people, you know, but, but not getting grounded and taking care of, of those issues. Um, one other thing that has really stuck with me, um, I had, as I was getting out of, out of the Marine Corps, I was a combat instructor, so after I did my three tours, I got voluntold to go to the schoolhouse and train all the infantry Marines um, in combat tactics, um, qualify them, and then they would go to their unit, and they would, they, some, some of them deployed. When the whole uh, Benghazi took place in 2012, um, I remember training a group of Marines, and we graduated them, and they went directly on a ship to get ready to get shipped out to go get those contractors out in Benghazi in 2012. <coughs> It happened just like that. They graduated, they grabbed the bag, they went on a ship, and they're on standby waiting for the president to say, go get them. And it was quick. So we used to train these guys, and then I got promoted to the schoolhouse, where I do kind of similar to what I'm doing now, but in all combat tactics and, and teaching, and then go evaluate them. So it was my time to uh, either re-enlist or get out. And I was talking to, I remember Pastor Eric about it. I'm like, man, I think I'm going to get out. I want to go on that Philippines trip you guys are going on. I can't do that being a, a United States Marine anymore um, because it's the needs of the Marine Corps. And they tell you what you're going to do. That's it. And so I'm wrestling with this. And finally, I just reached a point where I'm like, man, I did everything I wanted to do as a United States Marine. I want to retire at this job, but, I mean, I'm just going to keep deploying we're, during the time we're still at the time of war in Afghanistan, so I'm probably going to finish this out until I retired. I'd actually be retiring this August if I would have stayed in. Um, I don't know if I'd be alive, but I, I was just wrestling with this, so finally I just came to that, to that conclusion of I've done everything I wanted to do. It's time to go to the next chapter of my life. Let's move forward. So my leadership brought me in. Leadership Two things, okay? Good leaders, they'll give you that constructive criticism, okay? Give you some mentorship, and then you make a decision from there. Bad leadership will manipulate you and bring you down. Now, these leaders had really good intentions. I was with a, a sergeant major and a battalion commander, um, a lieutenant colonel. These are like the big dogs in the Marine Corps. They, who, they make the shots when you're over there overseas. They call the shots, and... I sat down with them directly because at the schoolhouse, you're in such a smaller unit. So you get to talk directly with like the highest ranking individuals. And they know you personally by name and they'll mentor you. So I sat down and they go, Ryan, what are you going to do? Well, they didn't call me Ryan. Sergeant Galvin, what are you going to do when you, when you get out? You say you want to get out. What are you going to do? He said, hey, I'm going to go home. I'm going to serve my local church. I'm going to get involved back uh, like in my hometown. I don't know. I'm going to use the benefits of, of the military, and then we'll see what happens from there. And they're like, he just told me just like this. And I agree with them 100%, but I'll just finish. He just said, what are you going to do in that life? Look at what you've done. And he pulled up my profile sheet and pulled up everything. Right. He said, look what you've done. The three combat tours. Two combat action ribbons in two different countries, four Navy and Marine Corps achievement medals. Like, You're a sergeant warfighter about to pick up staff sergeant. You're an instructor here. You have all these accolades for combat. We need you to continue to lead at the highest level. What are you going to do in that life? They don't want you out there. Right. So, but I, I told you, I agree with them to an extent. Right. He's correct during that chapter of my life. Yes. Right there. So now I move forward. And uh, 
well, I don't get called sergeant anymore, but I get called husband, dad, okay, different team now um, that I didn't think uh, would happen and take place, but now I have a whole different chapter who uh, look to me for different leadership. So he was right, but during that portion of my life, I know some of you might friends up here crying and stuff, and I'm trying to hold it back, but here we go. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with Mr. Lucas on this one, because what he was speaking about a few weeks ago on marriage, I was 100%. You're speaking my language. You're talking about how you treat Gigi. I do get called sergeant sometimes for my wife. So just, I'll put it out there, okay? I'll go right there, because you're speaking my language, and you're talking about all, all everything about how we should treat our spouse. And our next point. Your inner circle is point number three. Your inner circle. In Proverbs chapter 18. Just FYI, for our youth, we are going through the whole book of Proverbs. We're on moving on to Proverbs 9. We're going through this slowly because that's... We teach and mentor. I just want some feedback from them. So we're going through that book and taking our time through that. And it has been uh, just very good just with the wisdom and, and the feedback that your, your teenagers, um, we talk about the discussions we have when, when we're talking about these scriptures. Um, so in Proverbs chapter 18, verse 24, some friends may ruin you, but a real friend will be more loyal than a brother. I'm going to read that again. Because there's some of you that have these friends that are just like this. Some friends may ruin you, but a real friend will be more loyal than a brother. In Proverbs chapter 17, verse 17. Proverbs 17, verse 17. 17 through 22, I'm sorry. Proverbs 17, verse 17 through 22. So a dear friend will love you no matter what. And a family sticks together through all kinds of trouble. I'm just reading it from a scripture, okay? It's stupid to run up bills you never, you'll never be able to pay or to co-sign for the loan of a friend. Save yourself the trouble and don't do either one. If you love to argue, then you must be in love with sin. For the one who loves to boast is only asking for trouble. The one... What a perverse heart never has anything good to say. And the chronic liar tumbles into constant trouble. Parents of a numbskull will have many sorrows, for there's nothing about his lifestyle that will make them proud. A joyful, cheerful heart brings healing to both body and soul. But the one whose heart is crushed struggles with sickness and depression. So as we read this scripture, and we're talking about our inner circle, who are you, who are you going to run to? Who are you going to talk to? Okay, one, yes, we, we pray, we talk to God, accept Jesus into our heart, but then we have to get to a point where we have to trust individuals, make some friends who we know are going to mentor us and, and build us up just like this, not through our own words and our own advice, we're not, we're not good enough. Okay, I don't know if you hear me on that. We're not good enough. We need, as we give advice, as we're helping people, we need to take scripture, apply it, and then apply it to others. Because our, our, our own saving, our, our own grace is very little. When you think about it, we're angry. We're people. We're of the, of the flesh. And we deal with our own. But when we have scripture applied to us when we understand the gospel and how it can transform you we apply that into our lives and then you can apply it into others that's what my friends were doing the whole time during this dark time that's what my parents are doing during those years of dark time Mr. Lucas, Lewis, Pastor Kathy I had an inner circle a small group of, of individuals who were doing this consistently and finally just got to a point where I had to make that change on my own. I had, I had to stop putting those band-aids on those fractures. I had to let, let God 
break them up and then mend them back together. Now, when you think about it, if you've ever had a broken bone, you had you needed to fix those fractures. Okay, is it is it perfect? No. Seventh grade, I broke this wrist. Complete break right on the joint, and then heal correctly. There's like all kinds of scar tissue right here on top. Does it work? Yes. Helps me with jujitsu. Good grips, all of the above. This finger in jujitsu. You can't see it, but maybe you can. It looks like a Coca-Cola bottle. It's fat right here in the middle. Okay, I broke that training jiu-jitsu. Uh, I remember it broke completely, and when I popped up, I didn't want to look at it, and I just went like this and popped it back in. Immediately, so I can continue training, because I'm a weirdo like that, I just grabbed tape and taped them both together, and I just trained the next six months like this with them together, continue to train. Therefore, there's scar tissue. My friend's shaking her head. There's scar tissue, and there it is. So our wounds, they're not gonna come, they're not gonna fully heal at 100% like they used to be, but they'll be functional again. Okay, the same thing with our lives. No matter what happened, no matter what fractures you had in your life, you let God mend them back together, you let people mentor you and bring them back together, you're not gonna be, you're not gonna be perfect or, or awesome, that's okay, but what are you gonna be? You're gonna be functional. And guess what? With those functions, not only are you going to help yourself, you're going to be able to help others as well. Amen. Church of Stan. Amen. Good word. Amen. Church, I pray that uh, you just you receive this and don't. Um, I'm just a messenger. If you're, as we walk out of here and we pray, you're probably going to be wrestling already with your flesh if you're not now like do i do i follow this do do i talk to people about this i don't think they're going to understand what i'm going through Man, i went to war what do you do in war i volunteered for war you don't have to tell me to go i i wanted to go now i'm not like oh yeah i'm a fighter i want to go i was like no i'm i want to be a defender I'm a defender i want to do i want everything that the core has to offer and and, and defend it but I didn't know the repercussions. They don't, they don't train you about that. They just teach you to do one thing. Go and make it happen. Okay, so now listen. Your family, your friends, if you're single, your friends, okay? Your family, if you're married, your spouse, your kids, they're looking at you for the same thing. Okay? Be there. Mentor. Build that genealogy. Right? Fix those fractures. Help with their fractures as well, that way they don't hold on to them so long. They, my kids, that's what I'm doing with mine. I want them to see how quickly I can forgive my wife, how quickly she can forgive me. Amen. And we've gotten a lot better at that. And she held on to them for three days. I don't remember, th three years ago when I, when I spoke. Three days. Three days she held on to that. So it's quick, okay? Love, forgiveness, all of the above. Let's church just pray. Uh, Father, thank you for bringing us here today. Thank you for the time that we get to uh, spend together. I pray that you help us uh, break these generational curses in our life. Help us break these chains that will not have no relevance to our life, Father. We pray that you can help build us up and build us with your love, your peace, your mercy, your forgiveness, Father. Help us uh, forgive others. Um, help build our hearts, Lord. Help us with intentional forgiveness, Father. Let's have purpose, your purpose behind our forgiveness as we uh, pursue you, Lord, and as we pursue our spouse, our friends, our family, Father. We thank you for friends, friends who can mentor us and build us up. Thank you for your grace and mercy that's upon our life. Thank you for going to the cross, Lord, for our sins, Lord. Thank you for making this real for us, Father. We thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Church, I pray that you have a great day and you receive that. Love you. Have a good day. Well, good morning, church. Good morning, good morning. I pray and hope that you are all doing well. And if you are not, then I pray for you and I stand in faith with you and believe God with you for whatever it is that you are believing for. Um, I know our team is still in the Philippines. If, we, if you've seen any of the clips, man, they just, we just got, we just picked up right where we left off in uh, 2018 or 19. Which one was it? 19. It was the last year we were there. But they're there and they're doing, uh, it's awesome. They're doing, they're doing what 
we've been doing for many years, ministering to the people and just reconnecting. I know everybody was so glad to see um, each other there and uh, Pastor Vin and Imelda and Melvin. You guys remember Melvin? Uh, awesome, awesome man. He's a man and a father and a husband with many, many children now. And so living that life and letting the grace come out, letting the grace come out. And I know Blessing, I think they're, that's where they're at right now, I believe. They're in Ormoc uh, with Blessing and uh, Pastor Mimi and John, yeah. Jan, it's Jan, Jan. But they're there, and so um, they, I know we have a little video in, in a minute that we're going to show, but they're there, and they'll be back uh, Wednesday, Wednesday, late Wednesday night, and so we'll get to see them on Sunday and hear all about it. But we're here this morning, amen? Come on, now we're here this morning. We're here this morning, and uh, I have the opportunity to receive this morning's tithes and offerings, and uh, so prepare your hearts to give this morning. Before um, I read the scripture, the portion of scripture I'm going to read, I want to just put this out there that next Saturday, or I'm sorry, this Saturday coming up is Relay for Life, and I know it's a one-day event now, um, but I believe HD Church will be out there, will be out there, and so... Um, my reminder to you is that if you guys want to be out there to support, um, you're more than welcome to come on out to our booth, hang out, help us. Um, also, we will be endeavoring to compete in the many games that they have. And so I know they need some volleyball players and some relay race runners and tug of war. They need tug of war people. This I'm just, just relaying the information. So. If you guys are available, Saturday, it's pretty much all day Saturday. I don't know what the start, does anyone know what the start time is? It starts at noon? It starts at noon. Okay, so noon to what? Do you know any? Noon to four or five? Oh, okay, so noon to the evening. So eight o'clock, so noon to eight. But we'll be out there. So if you guys wanna come on by and, and, uh, and help out, we'll be there. If you have your Bibles, go with me to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. And I'm going to receive this morning's tithes and offerings. Ephesians 3, 14. I'll start there out of the Passion. Paul is, uh, the title says that Paul's praying for love to overflow. And he says this, So I kneel humbly in awe before the Father of our Lord Jesus, the Messiah, the perfect Father of every father and child in heaven and on earth and I pray that he would unveil within you the unlimited riches of his glory and favor until supernatural strength floods your innermost being with his divine might and explosive power then by constantly using your faith the life of Christ will be released deep inside of you and the resting place of his love will become the very source and root of your life then you will be empowered to discover what every Holy One experiences, the great magnitude of the astonishing love of Christ in all its dimensions, how deeply intimate and far-reaching is His love, how enduring and inclusive it is, an endless love beyond measure, measurement that transcends our understanding. This extravagant love pours into you until you are filled to overflowing with the fullness of God. Verse 20, never doubt God's mighty power to work in you and accomplish all this. He will achieve infinitely more than your greatest request, your most unbelievable dream, and exceed your wildest imagination. He will outdo them all for his miraculous power constantly energizes you. And now we, us church, now we offer up to God all the glorious praise that rises from every church and every generation through Jesus Christ and all that will yet be manifested manifest through time and eternity amen Paul is, is writing uh, at the end of chapter 3 and he's encouraging the people in the church of Ephesus and he's telling them look do not doubt what God can do in your life I'm gonna say that one more time don't doubt what God can do in your life you know, early I, I, I said, and, and I know this as, as human beings, uh, because we operate in time and God doesn't, it's harder for us because for us, that's how we are. We have timelines, right? We have dates, 
set things. We know when things are gonna happen. We're in the second quarter of this year, right? You know, better pay your taxes or hopefully you get something back. But the tax man waits for no one. And so uh, the IRS does not play. We understand how time works. God doesn't operate in the time that we do. He's infinite, right? So it becomes sometimes hard for us to, to keep our faith intact with God when we're believing for certain things because we desire that for them to happen right away. But Paul's writing and saying, man, do not doubt God's infinite power, his explosive power, his supernatural power, his favor upon your life. Now listen, at the very end, he says, now we offer up to God all the glorious praise. So verse 20 says, never doubt God's mighty power to work in you and accomplish all this. He will achieve infinitely more than your greatest request, your most unbelievable dream, and exceed your wildest imagination. He will outdo them all for his miraculous power constantly energizes you. And 21 says, now we offer up to God all the glorious praise that rises from every church and every generation through Jesus Christ. One of the things that I think we miss at times is that and not all of us, but maybe some of us, is that one of the ways we praise God is when we offer God a gift. And I know this is even hard for us to kind of wrap our minds around, right? When we give, when we sow, when we plant, there's nothing unbiblical about that. And I was talking with Shanette and Pat in the back, and that's what we, we said. We said, look, our lives, if, if we're paying attention enough, we, we say this here at HD Church that we are all spiritual farmers, right? All of us are. The only thing is, the only thing that you have to pay attention to is whether you're planting good seeds or bad seeds. Because I didn't say what type of spiritual farmer you could be. Right? So if you're sowing seeds that are not good, your words are not good, words are negative, you're angry all the time, you don't know how to forgive, right? That all can change, and that's the beauty of God. But that's what I'm talking about. You're sowing those things, then you probably are not going to reap what you would hope God would bring back your way, right? But then God begins to change you, Amen. right? You begin to see the goodness of God in your life, and his love begins to pour out of you, and you're not the same anymore. And now when you want to be negative, you, en you endeavor and you fight back against that and you speak the word of God over your life and over your situation. And then when you want to get angry, you're, you're quick to listen and you're slow to speak and you're slow to get angry. And so now you're not the same person anymore. And then you're learning how to forgive and you're learning how to apologize and you're learning how to say you are sorry. And now you are the encourager. Now you are the uplifter. Now you're the one bringing goodness to other people you will reap what you sow. Amen. And it's the same thing with giving, right? I don't doubt what God can do because I've already seen what God can do. And we're here every Sunday and our doors are always open. And you know what I love? Is I love that our doors are open and it doesn't matter if you're here one Sunday and then we don't see you for a while and you come back. Our doors are still open and we still love you. And we still, and we still want to tell you that God still loves you and that God wants to have a relationship with you. But listen to me. But these doors stay open because of what you plant. Amen. That is seed going into what we would call good ground. And so now we get back to what we just talked about a couple weeks ago. Seed, time, and harvest. We're planting good seeds because we know that the principle of seed, time, and harvest is that God, that God will bless, that God will bring, that God will prosper when we give. So now we offer up to God all the glorious praise. And one of the ways we do that is when we give. And that's my encouragement to you this morning, is it's up to you. You decide in your heart what you do here at HD Church. This is your home, and you're sowing into it. Thank you, appreciate that. Ushers, you guys ready? Amen. Amen, let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning, Lord, for every man and woman, every young man and woman that is 
has sown a seed this morning, Lord. I just thank you. I believe what your word says. I believe the principles of your word, Father. And we look to you as the author and finisher of our faith, Father. And so I thank you, God, for this church, for these people, Lord. I believe, God, your word is true. Your word, what your word says you will do, Lord. And I pray that we're patient in the times where we need to be patient, God. And we keep believing and trusting in you. And uh, I know, Lord, we will see and we will reap a harvest. And so I just pray for everyone this morning for their seeds sown into this good ground. Through time, Lord, you will bring a harvest to them. In Jesus' name, amen.